the subject of our session is admittedly one of the more obscure holy days mentioned in the Bible. Indeed, uh, one of the most obscure mentioned in one verse in the Bible, although intimated in some others, and yet simultaneously our concern, of course, is for the lessons, the messages that these holy days convey to us. I think we'll see that this one, despite its obscurity, is very relevant to us on many levels. Let's begin with the context of that one mention of the holy day that we're discussing in Zechariah chapter 7. We read, beginning in verse 1, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius, that the word of God came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Kislev. There's a list of people who present this question to entreat the favor of God. And the question, as we read it in verse 3, should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself as I have done these so many years? I must admit that the style and context of the question is very reminiscent of a phenomenon with which we are well acquainted to this day. Jews asking their rabbis, their spiritual leaders, questions about the Bible, questions about Jewish observance, how they should conduct themselves in various circumstances based upon God's instructions. Now, the question pertains, as we see here, to weeping in the fifth month. So perhaps before continuing, we should just clarify what weeping in the fifth month altogether means. And the answer emerges fairly readily when we consider a number of passages in the Bible that tell us what happened in the fifth month. At the very beginning of the book of Jeremiah, when the prophet gives us the context historically of his prophecy, we read that he was prophesying during the reigns of the kings of Judah unto, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month, the fifth month, the month of exile. We read in greater detail in the second book of Kings, in chapter 25, the last chapter of the book of Kings, in verse 8, now in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar Adan, the chief of the slaughterers, a servant of the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem. And he burned the house of God, the holy temple, the king's house, the royal palace, all the houses of Jerusalem, even every great man's house, burnt he with fire. In verse 10, they broke down the walls of Jerusalem round about. Verse 11, they carried the residue of the people left of the city into exile. The fifth month, the month of destruction, the month of the destroying of the holy temple, the month of exile. We read much the same description in Jeremiah chapter 52, the last chapter of Jeremiah, indeed, the last chapter of the book of Kings and the last chapter of Jeremiah are very similar to one another. There is one admittedly tantalizing difference. In verse 12, we read, in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, Again, Nebuzaradan, the chief of the slaughterers, who stood before the king of Babylon, 
came to Jerusalem. And of course, the glaring discrepancy between the reference in Jeremiah to the 10th day of the month and the reference in the book of Kings to the seventh day of the month does not escape our notice. It's something to which we relate far more specifically and in greater detail in our discussion of the fast of the fifth month, but it's not for now, so we'll leave it for a different discussion. For our purposes, in any case, we do appreciate very well what weeping in the fifth month, commemorating the destruction, signifies. And after around a chapter and a half in Zechariah chapter 8, in verses 18 and 19, we read God's response. The question, after all, should I continue to weep in the fifth month, is obviously prompted by the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. And by consequence, of that restoration in chapter 8 verse 19 thus says the god of hosts the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of judah joy and gladness and cheerful seasons but love you truth and peace now i suppose this is a good example of asking a question and maybe getting an answer that includes more than you had bargained to get. Because remember, the question pertained only to the fifth month. Well, here, we're not just reading about the fifth month, we're reading about the fourth and the seventh and the tenth, in addition to the fifth month. What's going on? In identifying what these other months are doing here, again, we turn to scripture, considering them serially. As for the fourth month, we read in Jeremiah chapter 39, in verse 2, that in the 11th year of Sedekia, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, a breach was made in the city. The walls of Jerusalem were breached by the Babylonians. We read the same date exactly in the last chapter of Jeremiah, in chapter 52, again, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, in addition to the breaching of the walls, the famine was sore in the city, so that there was no bread for the people of the land, then a breach was made in the city, and all the men of war fled, a more detailed description of what ensues, in any case, the fourth month, the month of commemorating the breaching of the walls of Jerusalem. Now, another discussion, again, not for now, but for when we'll discuss the fast of the fourth month in far greater detail, is why the date specified in scripture is the ninth day of the month. And in fact, nowadays, we fast on a different day of the month. But again, that's not for now. We've identified what the fourth month commemorates, and that suffices for our purposes at present. The fifth month, of course, we already discussed. As for the seventh month, we read in Jeremiah chapter 41. Now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nathania, the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, one of the chief officers of the king, and ten men with him came unto Gedaliah, the son of Achikam to Mitzpah. Who was Gedaliah? We read in verse 2 that Gedaliah was the one whom the king of Babylon had appointed over the land as his governor. And after eating with him in an act of utmost treachery, they slay Gedaliah, and we read in verse 3, with him they 
slew all the Jews that were with him and the Chaldeans that were found there. Ultimately, the significance of this act of treachery, as we read in the final chapter of the Book of Kings, in the second book of Kings, chapter 25, in verse 26, and all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the forces arose and came to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. So the last vestige of the presence of the nation of Israel in its land after the Babylonian exile was snuffed out following the destruction in the seventh month. So just to review here, we have a clear progression. The fourth month, the breaching of the walls. The fifth month, the destruction of the temple and of the walls of Jerusalem, the exile. The seventh month, the final nail in the coffin, so to speak, of this exile when the residue that remained in the land fled after the assassination of Gedalia. What of the 10th month? Now again, of course, we note the question didn't pertain to the 10th month. The question was just about the 5th month. And yet, there is a tantalizing subtlety with respect to the question that may perhaps indicate that when they asked about the 5th month, they also had the 10th month in mind. Remember in Zechariah chapter 7, verse 1, we read the circumstance, specifically the date of the question being presented. It was in the fourth day of the ninth month in Kislev, which raises an obvious question. They're raising a question in the ninth month pertaining to an observance that takes place in the fifth month? Around eight months later? Now, of course, we could say perhaps they were just planning ahead, which is a possibility. But human nature being what it is, there's another possibility. They were asking the question in the ninth month because they realized the answer necessarily would pertain to what they would be commemorating the very next month, in the 10th month. What happened in the 10th month? To answer this question, we turn first to Jeremiah chapter 39, where we read, in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, came the Bukhad Retzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem and besieged it. The tenth month is the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem. With greater specificity, including a specific date, we read in both Jeremiah chapter 52 and in the second book of Kings chapter 25, again, the last chapter of Jeremiah, last chapter of the book of Kings, in almost exactly the same words. Here we're reading in Jeremiah chapter 52, verse 4. It came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month. That's the ninth year of the reign of Zedekiah. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army, against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built forts against it round about, so the city was besieged. The siege of Jerusalem begins on the 10th day of the 10th month. So, in considering the progression that we already noted, the 10th month signifies the very beginning of that process that led to the destruction. And again, 
when the people ask the question in Zechariah chapter 7, should I be weak being in the fifth month? Now that the temple is rebuilt, what are we supposed to do? God's response, as we saw in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19, is with the rebuilding of the temple. These days of commemoration of the destruction become holidays, days of celebration. The fourth month, the fifth month, the seventh month, and the tenth month. Of course, we should note that these days have practical significance for us, not as days of celebration. Because predictably, once the temple was again destroyed, with the destruction of the second temple, these days revert to the status of days of mourning as they were observed during the Babylonian exile. And indeed, there are these four fast days that Jews continue to observe based upon these words of Zechariah to this day for the destruction of the temple and the exile from Jerusalem and the land of Israel. Now, we should note again that Zechariah in chapter 8, verse 19, the only one who specifically refers to these dates as days of observance, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, the fast of the tenth, refers not to specific dates. We glean the dates from elsewhere. He refers to fasting in these months. And indeed, there are circumstances that can lead us to fast not necessarily on the ordinary date for the fast, besides the question of which date is the appropriate date in the fourth month and in the fifth month and in the seventh month. I'll note, as a case in point, that each of those fasts can also, in our fixed calendar, come out on the Sabbath. Do we fast on the Sabbath? We'll return to that question in a moment. But first, with respect to the 10th month, besides the passages we already noted in Jeremiah, and in the book of Kings, there's another prophet who refers specifically to the 10th day of the 10th month. This is the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. The word of God came unto me in the ninth year, in the 10th month, in the 10th day of the month. Son of man, Write the name of the day, even this self-same day. This self-same day, the king of Babylon has besieged Jerusalem. While Ezekiel doesn't specifically refer to fasting on this date, he does refer to the significance of the date. And moreover, a special command by God to record the date and to observe it. Well, getting back to the question, that we raised a moment ago. What happens when a fast day occurs on Shabbat, on the Sabbath? We read, of course, in Isaiah chapter 58, in verse 13, how we are to relate to the Sabbath day, a day upon which you turn away your foot from pursuing your business and call the Sabbath a delight and the Holy of God honorable. So God commands us to make the Sabbath into a day of delight when these fast days occur on Shabbat. We postpone the observance of the fast to Sunday, to the next day, to not violate this precept that God gives us through Isaiah to call the Sabbath a delight. And that applies as Noted 
with respect to the fast of the fourth month and the fifth month and the seventh month. And in a sense, we could say it doesn't really affect our fidelity to the words of Zechariah because he referred to fasting in the month and we're fasting in the month. You'll note that I've been talking about the fasts of the fourth, fifth, and seventh months occurring on the Sabbath. What about the tenth month? And here we return to these words of God to Ezekiel. Write the name of the day, even this self-same day. This self-same day. The observance in the tenth month, according to the words of Ezekiel, needs to be specifically the self-same day. The tenth. And no other. If you ask, what happens if the fast of the tenth day of the tenth month occurs on the Sabbath? Well, the answer is, in our fixed calendar, in which the beginning of the year can only occur on certain days of the week because of some of the rules that pertain to the calendar, the tenth day of the tenth month can never occur on the Sabbath. So you might be thinking this is a completely academic question, but it really isn't. Because while the tenth day of the tenth month doesn't occur on the Sabbath in our calendar, it can occur on Friday, on the eve of the Sabbath. Now, when we have a fast day, we fast until nightfall. As you are undoubtedly aware, the observance of Shabbat, the observance of the Sabbath, begins before sunset. So what happens when the 10th day of the 10th month occurs on Friday? There's an overlap, after all. There's that space of time from the beginning of the Sabbath before sundown until the end of the fast day at nightfall. What happens? We keep on fasting. The observance of the fast actually encroaches upon the Sabbath. And there are those who interpret these words of Ezekiel to mean that if it were possible for the fast of the 10th day of the 10th month to occur on the Sabbath, on Shabbat, we would fast on Shabbat. We wouldn't be able to postpone that fast. Because again, the self-same day. Which inevitably raises an obvious question. That is, why is this fast so much more specific, in a sense, so much more severe than the others? And perhaps part of the answer may lie in the realization that with respect to the fast of the 10th month, there's actually an ambiguity. Which day of the 10th month are we supposed to fast? There's that obvious answer that we already noted, the 10th day of the 10th month. But, you know, the obvious answer is not always the correct answer. And in Ezekiel chapter 33, we read of something else that is specifically recorded as taking place in the 10th month. In chapter 33, verse 21, it came to pass in the 12th year of our exile, in the 10th month, in the 5th day of the month, that one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me, the prophet writes, saying, the city is smitten. The final nail, so to speak, 
in the coffin of the first commonwealth, Jerusalem, and the first temple. When word has decisively come to the community of exiles already in Babylon, the city is smitten. That was on the fifth day of the 10th month. And when you consider the progression of the events of destruction, you can't help but notice that there is a very clear tension here between these two dates of potential commemoration in the 10th month. That is, the fifth day of the 10th month, the culmination of the progression that begins with the events of the actual destruction in the fourth month. The fourth month, the wall is breached. The fifth month, the temple is burnt. The walls of the city are destroyed and the people are exiled. Seventh month, assassination of Gedalia and the scattering of the last remnant that remained in the land of Israel. Tenth month, fifth day of the month, the definitive report reaches Babylon. But the 10th day of the 10th month is before any of this has begun. The beginning of the siege. In some sense, you have the feeling that these two days of commemoration in the 10th month are at opposite ends of the spectrum. The 5th day, the final culmination. The 10th, some very vague beginning of a process that stretched over years and ultimately led to the destruction. And we return to those words of Ezekiel in chapter 24 when God tells him to write down this self same day, because it's not going to be the fifth, it's the tenth. The 10th is the day that we commemorate in the 10th month when the siege began. Not that final end when the refugee came to report that the city was spent. Which inevitably raises a vexing question. Why? Why commemorate the beginning of the siege? The beginning of the siege, it seems almost downright innocuous when we compare it with everything else, including that final definitive report of the smiting of Jerusalem. To amplify the question, just consider, this is not the first time that Jerusalem was placed under siege. Just around a century and a half earlier, we read in the second book of Kings, in chapter 18, verse 13, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And as we read in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 32, this is part of Sennacherib's sweep across Judah, culminating in the threat to Jerusalem. This very day shall he stand at Nob, shaking his hand at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Sennacherib comes to lay siege to the city. Well, why don't we commemorate that day when the siege of Jerusalem began in the time of King Hezekiah? I realize you're probably wondering, what a stupid question. The answer should be obvious, because that siege didn't lead to destruction. On the contrary, it led to an extraordinary miracle, divine salvation. As we read in the following chapter in the second book of Kings, in chapter 19, and we read these words of the prophet Isaiah 
not just in the book of Kings, but also in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Chronicles as well, that Isaiah sends to King Hezekiah, who has poured out his heart in prayer to God. Beginning in verse 20, thus says God, the Lord of Israel, whereas you have prayed to me concerning Sirachrib, king of Assyria, I have heard you. And the prophet continues, this is the word that God has spoken concerning him, the virgin daughter of Zion has despised you and left you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at you. Who do you think you are? O emperor of Assyria. And the culmination of these words of prophecy from verse 32, therefore thus says God concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come unto this city, nor shoot an arrow there, neither shall he come before it with shield, nor cast a mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come unto this city, says God. For I will defend this city to save it, for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. I have to share with you that when we have the blessed opportunity to spend Shabbat with groups of Christian believers here in Jerusalem, and I like to take them on a walking tour of the Holy City on the way to the Western Wall on the eve of the Sabbath. One of the landmarks that I always show is where the wall of King Hezekiah was discovered in the midst of the Jewish quarter during excavations. The wall that King Hezekiah erected when the Assyrian Empire swept through the cities of Judah and wedged between the stones of this wall is the sole Assyrian arrowhead that has been found in the land of Israel, wedged between the stones of the wall. The arrows never got in. God protected Jerusalem. And what happened in the end, as we read in verse 35 here, it came to pass that night that the angel of God went forth and smote in the camp of Assyria 185,000. And when men arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. And Jerusalem was saved. So of course, we're not going to commemorate the beginning of the siege as a day of mourning. Actually, on the contrary, by our tradition, King Sennacherib reached the walls of Jerusalem on the eve of Passover. And our commemoration of this date is there is the custom in many Jewish communities among the songs sung at the Passover Seder to sing of God's miraculously saving Jerusalem and smiting the army of the Assyrian Empire on the night of Passover. So again, we readily appreciate why this is not a siege to commemorate, certainly not as a day of mourning. But I ask the question because it does inevitably have implications with respect to what we are commemorating on the 10th day of the 10th month. Because while, of course, we recognize that that siege ended very differently with the destruction of Jerusalem, but we have our days of commemorating the destruction of Jerusalem. Again, the other fast days, fourth month, fifth month, seventh month, but in the 10th month, nothing happened. It was just the beginning of a siege. A siege in and of itself isn't destruction. 
Just consider what happened a century and a half before. So why have a day of commemoration of something as benign as the beginning of the siege? And I think the answer highlights for us what makes this fast day so significant and so relevant on manifold planes to each and every one of us. A siege in a terrifying, ironic way is a tremendous opportunity. When Sennacherib came to Jerusalem, it was an opportunity that was seized upon by Israel, seized upon by the people in Jerusalem. To return to God, to petition God, and ultimately to merit an extraordinary outpouring of God's grace in miraculously saving Jerusalem. So siege could be a tremendous opportunity. And undoubtedly, this siege in the time of Tzedekiah could have been a tremendous opportunity as well. But it was wasted. It didn't lead to miraculous salvation. It led to utter destruction. And we mourn not so much the siege itself. We mourn the tragedy of wasted opportunity when God gives us an opportunity. As we've discussed on many previous occasions, that automatically becomes our responsibility to seize the opportunity. We failed to seize that opportunity. And for that, we mourn. We mourn to this day because unfortunately the tragedy of wasted opportunities is a tragedy that keeps recurring. And that brings me to considering some additional motifs that are included in what we observe on the fast day of the 10th month. Events that by our tradition took place not on the 10th, but on the days that preceded it, on the 9th and on the 8th days of the 10th month. On the ninth day of the 10th month, we have a tradition that's expressed in the special prayers that we have on the fast day of the 10th day of the 10th month, that Ezra, the scribe, died. Which of course inevitably raises an obvious question. Why should we be commemorating, mourning the death of Ezra the scribe to this day. After all, everyone dies eventually, even the most righteous people. And obviously, everyone dies on some day of the year. So why should we be mourning the day upon which Ezra died? We realize that in the intervening close to 2,500 years, he obviously would have died one way or the other. So what's the morning about? And I think the answer inevitably lies in appreciating what the opportunity was. What the opportunity that Ezra personified, signified. At the very beginning of the book of Ezra, we read, as we do as well at the end of the book of Chronicles, of the extraordinary opportunity that came with the ascension of Cyrus, king of Persia, to the throne. 
In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of God by the mouth of Jeremiah was to be accomplished by God rousing the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth has God, the Lord of heaven, given me, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whosoever there is among you of all his people, his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of God, the Lord of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. The end of the Babylonian exile. The opportunity to return home. And we read in verse 5 of how the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, the priests and the Levites, were roused to go up to build the house of God in Jerusalem. And all who were round about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, gold, goods, beasts. A tremendous reawakening, a spiritual renaissance. Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of God that Nebuchadnezzar had sacked, and he delivered them to Shesh Bazar, the prince of Judah, to bring back the restoration. Not merely a restoration, but actually something far, far greater than just a restoration. We read in the prophecies of the prophets of the beginning of the Second Temple period. In Haggai, in chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, Thus says the God of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the choicest things of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house, the holy temple, with glory, says the God of hosts. Mine is the silver and mine is the gold, says the God of hosts. The glory of this latter house, the second temple, will be greater than that of the former, the first temple, says the God of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the God of hosts. Greater, greater glory of the second temple than the first. And likewise, in the words of another one of the prophets of the beginning of the second temple period, Zechariah chapter 2. In verse 14, some Bibles it may be verse 10, depending upon with which verse the chapter begins. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of you, says God. And many nations will join themselves to God in that day, and will be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you. And you will know that the God of hosts has sent me unto you. Again, an extraordinary opportunity. God is returning. He will dwell in your midst, says God. It didn't happen. We have a tradition reading what ostensibly is part of the promise in the first chapter of Haggai, in verse 8. Go up to the hill country and bring wood and build a house, the house of God, the holy temple, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, says God. Sounds, again, like a great promise, except there's a little subtlety that I admit you'll never be able to find in translation. It pertains to the difference between the way the Hebrew for I will be glorified is read in the words of the Bible and the way, ironically, it is spelt. There are occasionally 
such anomalies in the text. The spelling is deficient. In our tradition, that deficiency alludes to all the things that were missing in the second temple that had been present in the first. What happened? What happened to the opportunity? I have to admit, this is a very embarrassing subject. But it's a subject that we need to confront. In the second chapter of Ezra, at the beginning of the chapter, we read, now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of the exile, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled unto Babylon, and that returned unto Jerusalem and Judah, everyone unto his city. And there's a list of all of the returnees, and at the end of it all, we read in verse 64, the whole congregation together was 42,360. That's it? What happened to the rest of the nation? What happened to everyone? With all who were exiled? Only 42,360 were returning? And tragically, embarrassingly, the answer is yes. Besides what we read in the Bible, there are many ancient Jewish communities. Jewish communities that by their own tradition dated from the time of the Babylonian exile. Communities, for example, in the Arabian Peninsula, in North Africa, communities that we know from recent history as having been expelled by their host countries in the wake of the enmity toward the state of Israel, communities that predated the rise of Islam by many centuries. Communities that had traditions that Ezra actually came there and beseeched the members of these communities to come with him to Jerusalem to rebuild it. And the response? You have your Jerusalem in the land of Israel. We have our little Jerusalem over here. We're staying here. We're not going anywhere. An opportunity. An opportunity lost. Wasted. Squandered. And so when the temple is actually built, we read in the third chapter of Ezra, Beginning in verse 10, when the builders laid the foundations of the temple of God, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols to praise God. And we read in verse 12, the many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, the old men that had seen the first house, the first temple, standing on its foundation, wept with a loud voice when this house was before their eyes. Many shouted aloud for joy, that is, the young folks who had never seen the temple standing before, but the old folks who remembered the first temple looked at the foundations laid for the new one. This is restoration. And the second temple was only a glimmer of the glory of the first temple. God is always pouring out his spirit. But we need to prepare the vessels to receive God's spirit. When we fail to do so, God is still pouring out his spirit. But it ends up just a 
puddle on the ground. God was coming back, but we didn't come back. There was an extraordinary opportunity, an extraordinary opportunity that was lost. It took another 2,500 years or so for that opportunity to come back again now in our generation with the return of the nation of Israel to the land of Israel. I pray we don't waste this opportunity again. But again, when we mourn the wasting of an opportunity of the siege of Jerusalem, the 10th day of the 10th month, we also mourn the death of Ezra the scribe, who more than anyone else personified the opportunity that we had to restore what was lost when Jerusalem fell. The opportunity God gave, the opportunity we wasted. That, again, part of the commemoration on the 10th day of the 10th month, commemorating something that took place on the 9th. There's another commemoration, something that took place, this is not in the Bible, it's a post-biblical tradition, on the 8th day of the 10th month. The translation of the Torah into Greek. Now, why should we be commemorating the translation of the Torah into Greek as something negative, as a day of mourning? On the contrary. Isn't that the idea, that the words of the Torah should be disseminated throughout the world? And, of course, the short answer is, yes, of course. As we read in Deuteronomy chapter 27, there's a special precept that Moses conveys to the people of Israel. That, in verse 2, on the day when you pass over the Jordan unto the land that God your Lord is giving you, you shall set up great stones and plaster them with plaster and write upon them all the words of this Torah. Why write all the words of the Torah on these big stones? We get something of additional clarity when we read in verse 8, you shall write upon the stones all the words of this Torah very clearly. What's very clearly? An ancient tradition tells us very clearly means in 70 languages. The number 70, of course, corresponding to the archetypal nations descended from the sons of Noah. Why write the Torah in 70 languages? After all, the Jews speak Hebrew. Well, obviously, it's not just for the Jews. It's for the whole world. When the nation of Israel enters the land of Israel, it enters the land of Israel with a mission to disseminate these truths of God to the world. And indeed, in the following verse, in verse 9, we read, Moses and the priests, the Levites, spoke unto all Israel, saying, Pay attention and hear, O Israel. This day you are become a people unto God your Lord. What makes you into a people? This does. Disseminating the words of the Torah throughout the world. That was the goal. Not only was that the goal in general, there is, ironically, a special plea, place in our tradition vouchsafed for, of all languages, Greek. Noah, in chapter 9 of Genesis, in verses 26 and 27, blesses 
his two sons, Shem and Japheth. To Shem, blessed be God, the Lord of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. In verse 27, may God enlarge Japheth. And the second part of the verse, and he, or but he, shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Now, it's not clear in context if it is that God is to dwell in the tents of Shem, or if Japheth is to dwell in the tents of Shem. But in context here, we have a tradition that it refers to Japheth. That God enlarges Japheth. When? When Japheth is brought into the tents of Shem. When the beauty of Japheth, epitomized by Greek, a language of his descendants, is brought into the tents of Shem as a language of translation for the Torah. So the translation of the Torah into Greek really is an extraordinary opportunity. It's supposed to, after all, come into the world for all the nations to learn from it. So it's a tremendous opportunity, except not the way it was handled. The impetus for the translation was the Egyptian Greek King Ptolemy, who had the greatest library in the world, commissioning a translation of the Torah into Greek because it would be an unpardonable lacuna for his library to be missing this exquisite specimen of Hebraic culture. That's what it was. It wasn't Torah, meaning, as we've noted, teaching, coming into the world to guide the world to spirituality and godliness. Instead, it was an academic translation for academic purposes that led nowhere. This too is an opportunity, an opportunity wasted. For this too, we mourn on this day of mourning that's all about the tragedy of wasted opportunity. Now, I must admit that these observances are all fairly clearly enshrined in our tradition and commemorated in the special prayers, the special penitential prayers that are recited on the 10th day of the 10th month. The opportunity of the siege, wasted. The opportunity of Ezra, wasted. The opportunity of the Greek translation of the Torah, wasted. And yet there is another commemoration that I'd like tenuously, tentatively, to share with you. I hesitate because this is something that is shrouded in mystery, obscured not only by centuries, and in all honesty, the subject of great controversy, by no means anything even definite. And yet, there is an ancient tradition that on the ninth day of the 10th month, we are commemorating the death of someone else. Someone who might strike us as the most unlikely 
personality whose death we would be mourning, the death of Shimon, Simon, Peter. There is a fairly ancient, contentious, controversial Jewish tradition that Simon, Peter, remained faithful to the Torah of Israel all his life and is mourned as a righteous man. Now, I realize, obviously, that Christians view Simon, Peter, very differently. Ironic, isn't it, that according to this tradition, at least, both Jews and Christians will revere him as a righteous man, granted, from very, very different perspectives. What's germane for our purposes, and what I think it's critical for us to bear in mind, is to the extent that Simon signifies this bridge, in some sense, between Jewish tradition and Christianity. In a way, he personifies what might have been, what could have been a partnership between Judaism and Christianity, between Jews and Christians, before these two religions went their separate ways with often devastating ramifications. That is, when we imagine what might have been, can't help but consider the message of Isaiah in particular in chapter 49, a message addressed to my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified, a message expressed in chapter 49, verse 6. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to establish the tribes of Jacob and to restore the offspring of Israel. I will also give you for light of the nations that my salvation may be unto the end of the earth. God's goal is not merely the salvation of one people. A group of individuals that my salvation may be unto the end of the earth and i submit that that goal is most advanced when jews and christians can stand together in partnership because while god designates israel as the light of the nations israel doesn't get to the end of the earth Israel is summoned to be here in Zion to broadcast that message of godliness, of holiness, that message of the Torah, that light to the end of the earth demands a partnership of Jews and Christians standing together. That is the most apt fulfillment of God's mandate here expressed through Isaiah, something that might have been, should have been, could have been, wasn't. In verse 8, thus says God, in a time of favor have I answered you, and in a day of salvation have I helped you, and I will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. A vision, a mission, a goal, an opportunity, an opportunity at a time of favor. We don't know what happened 2,000 years ago. Only God knows. 
Was it a time of favor? How should things have happened differently? But it was an opportunity that was lost. Another story of wasted opportunity. If I can express this using two passages from the prophecy of Jeremiah. And I stress at the outset, I am not reading these passages simply according to their plain meaning. The plain meaning is relatively clear, but there's an additional dimension that I think the timeless words of the prophet may intimate. On the one hand, in Jeremiah chapter 4, we read the moan of the prophet in verses 15 and on. For hark, one declares from Dan and announces calamity from the hills of Ephraim. Make you mention to the nations, behold, announce concerning Jerusalem. Watchers, in the Hebrew, Notzerim. Come from a far land and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. As keepers of a field are they against her roundabout, because she has been rebellious against me, says God. A prophecy of retribution and destruction. Retribution and destruction mediated by the watchers. Notzerim. Who come to Jerusalem. To destroy. And in contrast, Jeremiah chapter 31. This isn't for here and now. In verse 2, we read, From afar, God appeared unto me. And his message, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with kindness have I drawn you. Again will I build you. And you will be built, O virgin of Israel. Again, you will be adorned with your tabrets and will go forth in the dance of them that make merry. Again, shall you plant vineyards upon the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall redeem them. For there shall be a day that the watchers, the watchmen, the same word in the Hebrew, notzerim, shall call upon the Mount Ephraim. Arise you, and let us go up to Zion, unto God our Lord. I'm sure it hasn't escaped you. These two passages both feature the word notzerim. Literally in the text, undeniably, the meaning is watchman. These words, after all, were written centuries before Notzerim became the way to refer in Hebrew to the adherence of a new religion, Christianity. But still, these two passages, to me, symbolize something. There is an aspect of Watcher's Notzerim in Jeremiah chapter 4, and it's a reflection undeniably, because Judah has been rebellious against me. An aspect of Notzrim that come and give their voice against the cities of Judah to destroy. There's also another aspect seen by the prophet only from afar, because it's not then and it's not immediately accessible. But a day upon which Notzerim, watchman, perhaps with another sense, another connotation, yet unanticipated, except by the prophet, shall call upon the Mount Ephraim, Arise you and let us go up to Zion unto God our Lord. 
two thousand years ago, we don't know what happened. It may well have been an opportunity. Certainly, whether it was or not, it was wasted. And Judaism and Christianity went in different ways that led to devastating consequences. Maybe God is giving us a second chance. So when we consider the message of the fasting of the 10th month and why it is so profoundly relevant to each and every one of us to this day, again, the first most basic sense the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem. That was opportunity. And it's the tragedy of wasted opportunity. And then there was the opportunity in the time of Ezra, the restoration. And again, a wasted opportunity. And maybe only now, approximately 2,500 years after Ezra, is God giving us this opportunity again. And the opportunity of disseminating the truths of God's word, of the Torah, throughout the world. An opportunity that expressed itself in the translation of the Torah into Greek, but in a manner that signified not opportunity seized, but again, opportunity wasted. And likewise, two millennia ago, when that partnership between Jews and Gentile Christians might have gone on a totally different trajectory than it did, might have been an opportunity, and again was lost. And while we read about the watchman in Jeremiah chapter four, they aren't coming to build, but to destroy. It may be. After two millennia, God is giving us this opportunity a second time. For Jews and Christians to come together, for in a very different way than that original translation of the Torah into Greek, the words of the Torah to ring from the hilltops and illuminate a world that's so dark and so craving for that light that only the Torah can provide an opportunity. What will we do with it today? We conclude again with the words of Zechariah. That promise, a promise of the future, and still is a promise of the future. To the fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, will be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful seasons. But love you, truth and peace. And the prophet continues. Thus says the God of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come peoples and the inhabitants of many cities. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go speedily to entreat the favor of God, to seek the God of hosts. I'm going too. Yea, many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek the God of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of God. An opportunity. And I'm blessing all of us when God gives us opportunities. May we learn the lessons of the past, not waste them anymore. To harness the message of the fast of the tenth, the fast that marks the tragedy of wasted opportunity, to seize the opportunity, because 
That's the responsibility God gives us. I'm giving you the opportunity. Don't waste it. Maybe rise to that challenge and become worthy of God's blessings. God bless you.